Hello and welcome to Taiwan Talks, bringing you the latest news from Taiwan. I'm Annie. I'm Rath Wang. As Manila boosts its military ties with Washington and Tokyo, China sent its Navy ship, the Qi Ji Guang, on a goodwill visit to the Philippines. We'll look at what this means for the region as superpower competition intensifies. Joining us today are Liu Fu Kuo, director of the Taiwan Center for Security Studies and research fellow at the Institute of International Relations at National Chanchi University. Alexander Huan, international affairs director and representative to the U.S. of the Kuomintan, Taiwan's largest opposition party. And of course, Raymond Sun, affiliated researcher of the think tank Taiwan New Constitution Foundation, an expert in Taiwan and the region's geopolitics. Well, welcome to the show. Thank you. The Chinese naval training ship Qi Ji Guang made a three day trip to the Philippines, including a port of call in the capital, Manila. This was the last stop after touring Vietnam, Thailand, and Brunei. Professor, as the first of its kind since 2019, what do you believe China is trying to achieve here, given that um, President Marcos Jr. is pivoting more to the U.S. in terms of defense? Uh, <clears throat> basically, this is a quite routine exercise uh, from China. Um, but of course, uh, currently China is uh, putting extra effort in order to balance uh, the new policy by President Marcos Jr. And currently, looking back in the last uh, two months, uh, Minister of uh, Foreign Affairs, Qing Gang, just also visited the uh, Philippines in a way also to balance uh, the, the largest uh, military exercise uh, among allies, the U.S., uh, the Philippines, as well as uh, Japan, Australia, all in this uh, circle. So there is a consistent and regular exercise uh, from Chinese uh, government because uh, just uh, before President uh, Marcos Jr. won the election. Uh, president, the former president, Duda Dad, enjoyed so close uh, relations with China. Right. So uh, he, under his uh, term, he has uh, already managed and conducted uh, such uh, close uh, relations and also a number of uh, projects already being developed between China and the Philippines. So basically, of course, there is a very strong political intention behind this move. But uh, I, I think every military operation connecting China and the Philippines would have to always uh, initiate it or plan much earlier. So it, it is not coming just uh, in a sudden. So from my observation, basically China really understands uh, currently uh, President Marcos is now tilting much toward uh, the United States. So with this visit, it might be able to balance a little bit and remind uh, domestic political support for, the, for China on this uh, particular sense. So I'm looking into this, especially uh, early this year, so much has uh, happening between the US and the Philippines. So China already putting onto such a busy diplomatic agenda connecting with the Philippines. So this is uh, something that I consider China is now balancing back, uh, trying not to really push uh, the Philippines much uh, further closer, closing to the United States. So Alex, do you see this as a ploy, or do you agree with the professor that it's nothing out of the ordinary? Well, it is a, uh, clearly a, a competition, uh, because um, I, I think from, uh, if you look at the map, uh, you know, if China wanted to um, project its uh, power beyond the first island chain, you know, to the north is Miyako Strait, to the south is the Basi, Basi Channel. And the Philippines' uh, uh, relationship or security relationship with the United States is not as close and clear with uh, like uh, U.S.-Japan alliance. Uh, the, the increase of the United States' involvement and, and engagement with the Philippines is definitely trying to strengthen the southern part uh, of the island chain, uh, you know, looking at the South China Sea as that's well close to as Taiwan, that's as well as Taiwan. Mm -hmm. So, so I think uh, this is a competition. You know, uh, you know, President Marcos Jr. visited Beijing as well earlier, uh, and then uh, the Chinese Foreign Minister as well as some military operations 
um, you know, uh, also trying to connect uh, China and the, and the Philippines. Don't forget, even with the Qi Ji Guang, you know, visiting, uh, primarily with uh, humanitarian assistance and disaster relief materials, they're provided for the Filipinos. But don't forget that they have other areas that with very high tension um, in the South China Sea. Tensions indeed. Um, Raymond, I wanted to bring you to the Chinese naval vessel. Um, it shadowed the Philippines yeah. actually when the Chi Ji Guang was yes. still in Manila. Yeah. Um, the Francisco Danghoi of the Philippines yes. in its own easy. What do you say to that? Okay. Uh, it's very clear for the Chinese, the policy won't change. The policy of the Chinese is um, de facto control of the waters under its jurisdiction in the South China Sea, uh, irrespective of uh, other claims, claims by other states. And uh, it won't be eased uh, uh, parallel to any friendship and cooperation gestures. And that's very clear. That's the same to the Philippines, to the Taiwan as well. And uh, for example, in Taiwan's year when Ma Yingzhou was in power, and uh, the international community says, you are now on good terms with, the, with China, but I was the legal advisor in some fisheries organizations when we are arguing or negotiating for our session conditions. The Chinese won't ease a bit. So that's the typical uh, two-hand uh, strategy China will, will maintain that the whole framework of uh, uh, policy won't change out of uh, reasons of some softened gestures will be put on show. So you're saying it's carrots and um, also sticks at the same the time? The sticks will remain the same. While asserting power? Yes, actually, for example, for in the case of South China Sea, the very aggressive enforcement, law enforcement activities conducted by the Coast Guard of Chinese and its Navy, backed by its Navy, has never been changed over the past eight or nine years. Mm -hmm. and, and Professor, I want to go back to a little bit because you were saying that back in um, President Duterte, it was kind of more like a pro-China relationship. But when President Marcos started taking office, everything just kind of shifted a little bit. As we can see, there's a lot of military drills going on recently, and this as well. So why do you think this, what was the major reason behind this shift? Was it because China was not really, whatever actions that China has is not what Philippines was expecting in the first place? Um, basically, there are two very strong uh, pressures uh, from behind the scene. Mm -hmm. Number one is a domestic political pressure. Um, as uh, all of us know, for such a long period of time, uh, security establishment in the Philippines are all uh, developed or helped by the United States. So there is a very strong pro-American uh, perspective. Mm -hmm. inside the Philippines. Domestically. Yes. Mm -hmm. But of course, there is uh, also another end. Uh, after President Duterte was uh, empowered, and there is also another group of uh, uh, political supporters inside the Philippines, which uh, uh, they are not considering tilting toward the United States as uh, on the only way or the best way for the country. So they want to do a lot more with China. So with this uh, political pressure domestically push uh, President uh, Marcos Jr. to think that he should not, as soon as uh, he uh, took the office, he should not really side completely with China like his uh, predecessors. So this is uh, the first domestic pressure. The other one is the uh, United States. President Joe Biden already pushed uh, the Philippines so much because uh, in, during uh, his uh, predecessor's uh, era, the United States could not really do much about it. So finally, um, the US and Philippines would be able to sign the new term mm -hmm. and then agree upon a full military base. Three are located in Luzon Island, and the other one is a Palawan <coughs> facing toward the South China Sea. So this is a completely new era. Mm -hmm. So I, I do think there are two significant pressures. So immediately after uh, President Marcos visited uh, his uh, China. Then the incident gradually comes up in the South China Sea. Right. So surrounding the second Thomas Shelf and also the incident surrounding T2 Island. It shows that uh, the Philippine government should, ha should really take something vis-a-vis -vis China. Mm -hmm. 
-hmm. So he cannot just uh, neglect as a uh, president do that they did in the past. Right. So public opinion is coming up very strong. Mm -hmm. So basically he is now shifting little back a little bit to the United States. Right. Thank you, Professor. But Alex, do you agree with the professor saying based on these two important pressures, do you think this shift to the U.S. will sustain, especially if Philippines also relies on Chinese market economically? If we look at it in a longer term, I, I would say that as long as China continue to expand its influence uh, beyond its coastline uh, and into the South China Sea, mm -hmm. um, the Philippines will continue to feel the, uh, the heat and the pressure uh, because the Philippines by its own cannot deal with uh, the Chinese expansion, mm -hmm. uh, you know, measures or movement in the South China Sea. President Duterte had that kind of experience. Mm -hmm. uh, as Foucault just mentioned, that even after uh, Marcos Jr.'s visit to Beijing, um, you know, China continued to expand uh, its influence, uh, especially, you know, recent incident in the second Thomas Shoal. Um, that make the Filipino people believe that that China always uh, play heavy-handed card, mm -hmm. uh, you know, over the Philippines. So it's to me is natural for them to shift the uh, gravity a little bit. Um, I'm not saying that uh, that the Philippines will have a one-sided policy, mm -hmm. you know, from different presidency, but I think they are smart enough to play the game and try to keep the balance as much as they can. Mm -hmm. Keeping the balance indeed. Um, Raymond, I wanted to ask in terms of um, shifting gravity, we've seen the Philippines become more assertive in terms of claims in the West Philippine Sea. Yes. Does this set an example for other countries such as Taiwan to push back on China? Um, it's hard to say. Actually, during the uh, 2013 to 2016, when the Philippine government then was raised the initiated the arbitration um, on the trying to destroy the legality of Chinese claim over the Southwest Philippine Sea, and it succeeded. Actually, if you view that as an unfriendly gesture, that <coughs> might be even more uh, provocative or or advanced. advanced. And uh, that result is uh, a very fully reasoned legal document and uh, given much, much evidence to elicitate the lack of uh, any justification of the Chinese maritime claim in the South China Sea. But uh, on the ground, to be implemented in its strength, and uh, <coughs> alone, Philippines cannot stand up to China. And it, of course, now, after the experience under the Duterte era, when Duterte shifted the focus back, trying to tilt it with China more, but uh, in exchange, promises that promises, all empty promises that mm. uh, the Philippine people had enough. Mm. Because no matter with regard to fisheries uh, in Scarborough, um, it's not solved. A actually, the access of the waters by the, the Filipino fishermen was found great difficulties. Right. And the problems with uh, new advanced uh, incidences in, in those uh, offshore shoals. With the razor beams and all. Right, that. and the very aggressive Coast Guard enforcement, including using military grade uh, laser beam. And uh, in exchange, of course, that uh, the Filipino people had to find a big friend mm -hmm. to sa stand on their side, especially back to the legal position. And what they did is fully justified, and uh, it's not aggressive, it's only claiming what is he, it entitles to mm -hmm. claim. So there's a mismatch in China's commitment to the Philippines. Much Thank you, Raymond. So, so yes. Rath spoke earlier to Jay Patan Bakel, University of the Philippines Institute for Maritime Affairs and Law of the Sea Director. Jay tells us what the Chinese Navy ship visit means for the U.S.-Philippines Security Alliance. Jay, in light of the recent Philippines Independence Day, obviously mm -hmm. independent from the United States, what is the current state of U.S.-Philippine ties, especially in terms of joint maritime defense? Well, I think that the uh, Philippine-U.S. ties remain strong, you know, despite uh, some uh, headwinds in the previous administration. They have rebounded and are now stronger than ever. 
uh, especially when it comes to defense um, relations. Uh, this year, we've seen the biggest ever exercises so far held between the Philippines and the United States. And uh, it was um, even uh, personally attended by the president. So I guess that is also an indication of the um, strong interest that the current administration has in improving defense relations. Um, with respect to um, other areas such as uh, economics and culture and and all of that, it also uh, still remains very, very, very strong. Is this a response to more aggression from mm -hmm. China in terms of um, harassing or aggressive action towards mm -hmm. um, waters that the Philippines also claims and towards a Filipino fishermen? Well, I think it's uh, really a result of uh, several years of uh, neglect, shall we say, uh, with the previous administration and its attempt to try to curry favor with China, uh, basically being shown to have been uh, futile. So um, now what we see is the Philippines really um, trying to push back and um, flex uh, its international rights and entitlements and getting help from allies like the United States as well as other uh, friends and countries, uh, friendly countries uh, like Japan and Australia. So now we see that our maritime uh, activities have also been uh, increasing, not just in the um, defense uh, realm, but also in terms of uh, economics. Uh, we have now the government actively encouraging our fishermen to go out and uh, and uh, use our resources uh, in the West Philippine Sea. So that is, uh, again, also um, a sign of uh, renewed confidence, shall we say, that we really should be going out there, um, exercising our rights and entitlements. And we do so also with the support of these many other countries, um, our allies and partners and friends. So I think that that shows, um, that indicates that vis-a-vis uh, uh, -vis China and its um, aggressive activities, uh, the Philippines has also been speaking out more and really showing to the world uh, what it is that China is doing uh, in our seas, in our waters, despite our attempts to uh, establish a friendly and cordial relations with them. Speaking of pushing back against Chinese aggression, mm -hmm. um, we've also seen China try to court the Philippines. Um, we've seen a recent visit by Chinese um, maritime vessel um, by Chinese Navy vessel Qi Ji Guang coming into the Philippines. What is the purpose of this? And do you see anything coming out as a result of this visit? I don't really see anything coming out of it in the first place. The publicity around it has been relatively low key. Even the uh, Chinese embassy, I, do, I don't recall any major announcement being made or anything being made out of that visit. So. For, for me and probably for the rest of the government, it's just a routine ship visit uh, of a training vessel that was passing by uh, from another place. Now, I think it came from uh, Indonesia or somewhere uh, further south, no? so just passing by. And the Philippines basically is just uh, demonstrating that, uh, okay, it, it's, it, we're not like, um, we're not like children, okay? Um, we are showing that we can still be cordial and friendly to all nations, no? um, despite having these issues. Uh, and I guess it's also a, a way for the Philippines to demonstrate that it also abides by the by the law, the international law, um, which makes its ports also open to uh, friendly ship visits. No? So as long as that ship visit is just what it is, it's just a visit, I don't think anything um, major will come out of it policy-wise. After all, um, you know, the relations between the Philippines and China will not be defined by this single visit of a training ship. No? It's really a much broader uh, canvas that we're looking at, and that is defined by basically how China treats the Philippines in, in general respects, such as with respect to the maritime issues, with respect to uh, the West Philippine Sea, for example. That is what really uh, defines that relationship, not just these occasion, occasional uh, visits. Despite expected minimal effects of um, the maritime, uh, let me restart. Despite limited effects from the Chinese training ship visit to the Philippines, do you feel that China will cave in because the Philippines is speaking up more on its claims in the West Philippine Sea and pushing back on um, 
what many would say is a one handed um, fist approach to mm -hmm. its neighbor. Well, of course, I don't expect China to change overnight. You know, it will not crumble immediately. But what I have noticed is that it has been uh, adjusting, uh, stepping back a bit, you know, um, knowing that whatever it does, which is um, you know aggressive and controversial, will be revealed to the whole world immediately. I think that uh, changes a bit their behavior as well. Um, so I think that um, this is a sign that um, it is possible for small countries like the Philippines to basically stand up for itself and insist, insist on its rights and entitlements under international law and rely on the support of the international community you know, uh, to vindicate uh, those rights. And even a, a country as powerful as China will have to respond appropriately, will have to change its behavior in a way that is in accord with uh, the expectations of the international community. You know? And eventually, hopefully, eventually that will lead to it um, um, stopping, you know, uh, restraining itself from using this, this heavy-handed approach uh, against its smaller neighbors. Given the, that the Philippines is having more confidence in pushing back against Chinese aggression, um, moving to another smaller neighbor, Taiwan, do you feel mm -hmm. with the Philippines standing up, what effect will this have on Taiwan? I think that the Philippines really should uh, stand up for Taiwan in the sense of supporting it and its its current um, status. No, uh, it really should not be subjected to these threats of, of aggression, um, and we should um, also support Taiwan in terms of economic, uh, political, and cultural ties. I think it's very important for us to do that because, after all. Uh, Taiwan is uh, one of our closest neighbors, and we also get a lot of trade um, from Taiwan. Uh, we get a lot of our products from there, and we also send a lot of our own people to Taiwan. And recently, I noticed uh, even um, ordinary people um, have been taken an interest in Taiwan because of the tourism opportunities that are there. So I think that that kind of support will help um, deter any uh, aggressive actions, aggressive moves against Taiwan, and we really should be uh, doing that because it is an important um, um, factor in the stability of this entire region. Do you feel that you'll see more of that support coming out from the Philippine administration, especially in terms of security and the other aspects that you mentioned? It's only been a year into this administration and it hasn't really very openly uh, described its uh, policies towards Taiwan. But I think that um, eventually we could look towards uh, some changes and, and some more openness on the part of the current government uh, with this because Taiwan clearly is a very important uh, partner um, in its, uh, especially for its um, economic uh, development uh, um, programs. The U.S. has given the Philippines a boost of confidence with increased support both in defense and economically. Professor, what's behind this renewed support and actions out of the Philippines? Um, <clears throat> currently, between the U.S. and China, this is uh, going through a strategic competition. But of course, the U.S. under President Joe Biden, uh, one of the great efforts is uh, to connect with all the airlines and friends in the region. Is that to secure the first island chain? Or? Yes, mm -hmm. and also beyond this, uh, another mechanism is a core members connecting Australia, uh, India, Japan, and the United States. So basically, um, talking about the joint military drills between the U.S. and the Philippines, starting from early this year, um, the capital cities are communicating with each other. Definitely this year, they want to bring in Japan and Australia into this uh, military exercise. And what we have seen early this month in the Shangri-La Dialogue in Singapore, um, Japan, Australia, the Philippines, and the United States, already the Minister of uh, Defense, four of them met on the sideline of uh, Shangri-La Dialogue, and of course, coming up to Coast Guard joint exercise. So that is a signal that they are gradually built on every strength, military, and also a Coast Guard in order to make it as a mechanism, joint mechanism together 
So I do think this is under such a competition. But quite interestingly, why uh, the US always uh, play such a uh, double hands uh, effort. Mm -hmm. On the one side, as we can see, this uh, national security trilateral meeting held in uh, Tokyo over the last uh, weekend. And at the same time, Secretary of uh, State Blinken right. is uh, in Beijing. So this is a balancing mm -hmm. as well from the United States. Um, Alex, as a military expert, um, Professor mentioned the Shangri-La Dialogue. And mm -hmm. it was interesting because you saw how assertive China was at that meeting in terms of Taiwan. And do you feel that the Chinese now are feeling threatened with the US um, aligning with Japan, boosting ties with the Philippines? And you've seen <coughs> somewhat increased support with Taiwan as well. Yeah, from a bigger picture, um, I would frame it as a mutually induced uh, strategic anxieties on both capitals. Because the United States is, you know, watching closely about the rise of Chinese influence uh, in the Indo-Pacific region as a whole. But on the other hand, um, China also have witnessed that the United States effort, uh, you know, like Foucault has said, you know, uh, strengthening the Quad dialogue, you know, the AUKUS, and the U.S.-Japan-Korea trilateral, and now U.S.-Japan, the Philippines trilateral, and also involving uh, the Australians. So I think uh, China is o also looking at not only the uh, high tech and, and uh, supply chain part, but also the geopolitical part that the United States is rallying uh, more support uh, in different groupings mm -hmm. of the alliance system uh, right. to keep uh, China intact or if not encircled. So I, I, I think that it, the feeling uh, is mutual to mm -hmm. me. Uh, and, and definitely uh, China can feel that the United States uh, strategy to uh, rally more closer collaboration and, mm -hmm. and support among the allies. So, so we're so seeing mm -hmm. that the allies are a lot more solid now. So Raymond, w initially we also discussed about the real reason or the, the motive behind Philippines wanting to shift from China to the U.S. But now let's talk a little bit more about Japan. Professor also talked, major event to share is to bring Japan in. And Japan was also trying to assist Philippines in all sorts yes. of needs. What is the ma major motive behind this? Firstly, may I just say that the, the motives behind those uh, allies is to prevent the change of status quo unilaterally by force. Mm -hmm. Actually, it's a defense, defensive, uh, defensive posture. It's not a aggressive or encircling China, which is not the case. Actually, the United States is, uh, you over the years, was the one of the major sponsors for Chinese to peaceful arise and uh, mm -hmm. to become a major player on the economic global economic scene. And there's no point, it's a policy aim of the United States never, has never been enclosing China or trying to suppress China's rights. I, so it's to me, it's, uh, I, it's, I think it's very important. Uh, coming back to Japan, Japan wanted to play a greater role in the geopolitical scene. Right. And it, of course, it, wa it, it tied up to its agenda to become a normal stage, uh, normal state on the global stage. And of course, its uh, assistance to Southeastern and Asian countries has over the year been quietly done a great achievement in doing that. And of course, Japan is also a very quiet helper behind U.S. development and pushing forward this Indo-Pacific strategy. And uh, it's also for Japan's own safety and security because the majority of uh, Japan's energy and its exports came through uh, Taiwan Strait and to the uh, South China Sea. So the open and the free access to the maritime spaces there was also crucial for Japan's sustainability. Right. And also for security because uh, not only that the uh, Indo-Pacific situation is tied up with the NATO or European ones, but all those across the first island chain in northeastern part and in southeastern part of Asia are all intric intricately tied up with. So, so they wanted to show up and put up those posters to say that, look, we are together, 
So then we are raising the high bar, raising the bar of the cost mm -hmm. for you uh, unilateral use of force to change the status quo. Mm -hmm. So please don't try that. Right. So because we are getting ready and we are trying very hard. So how do you think China will react to this? China will try to, of course, China's Avenue has another one, so which is economic coercion and political mm -hmm. persuasion, especially within Taiwan, because nobody can force Taiwanese people to do this or that. Right. If Taiwanese people turn out on the first month of next year to say that we want a more conciliatory attitude to China, to China, then nobody can say anything if that is the Taiwanese people wanted. Mm -hmm. Professor, in addition to the Coast Guard drills, we see Japan also increasing its defense budget. It also promised um, providing radars to the Philippines. And mm -hmm. How does this come into the Taiwan context, given that Taiwan's sandwiched between the two countries? <coughs> okay, this is a very timely and critical question. Uh, looking back last year, back in 2022, uh, Japan has uh, revised its uh, national security strategy, and it has uh, already shifted its uh, long-standing, uh, more passive uh, strategy in the context of uh, Taiwan security here. So, um, Early on, before last year, uh, Japan has uh, already continuously <coughs> supported uh, uh, Coast Guard uh, cap capacity of the uh, Philippines. They donate uh, uh, some number of uh, Coast Guard ships to the Philippines in a way to strengthen its uh, uh, law enforcement capability in the South China Sea. But later on, uh, Japan, after reviewing its uh, national security strategy, it has uh, changed uh, uh, dramatically. And now it is involving in the region, not just uh, Japan's uh, self-defense uh, itself. So uh, over the last uh, couple of years, Japanese uh, politicians are uh, saying, if Taiwan has uh, something, then it is a matter of uh, Japan's uh, security concern. So I, I don't think it is um, official line yet, but everyone knows this is uh, exactly what Japanese government is taking. So Japan's uh, already realized connecting with the United States, it has to contribute a lot more, not just uh, in the South China Sea, but also uh, Taiwan Strait uh, contingency. So in this sense, looking into the North Japan and into the South of Taiwan, mm -hmm. These two countries, uh, the United States is uh, helping these two countries to get ready for the wars to come in the Taiwan contingency. If something really happened, they can launch it from nearby Japanese uh, islands, Okinawa or uh, the Philippines. So that is exactly returning back to your question. Japan is now looking into much more, um, perhaps a significant role in uh, East Asian security which is beneficial to Taiwan indeed. Um, Alex, despite the professor calling it the Self-Defense Force, which is its official name, mm -hmm. it's one of the most um, powerful militaries in the region or even in the world. Yes. Will this deter China if Japan is more involved in terms of defending in the case of a Taiwan contingency? Well, uh, you know, we all know that Japan has doubled down its uh, defense spending uh, in the planning in the next few years, and also Japan uh, has a uh, more collaboration with the regional states. Uh, it is out of not only uh, the United States strategy, but Japan felt the heat, you know, uh, from U.S.-China strategic competition, the Taiwan possible Taiwan scenario, and uh, and the South China Sea. So Japan has turned itself become more proactive started from uh, former Pre Prime Minister Shinzo Abe and uh, con followed and continued by Prime Minister Kishida. So they're saying Japan feels threatened by oh what yeah. it sees Oh yeah, it. or otherwise uh, they won't, you know, we won't see the statement in their new strategy document. And also we can reference to how uh, Prime Minister Kishida planned the G7 meeting mm -hmm. and involving Global South and um, and uh, many other partners and uh, international organization chiefs uh, to the meeting. 
uh, this is, on one hand, uh, a Japanese desire to expand its uh, international influence, but on the other hand, it play a more proactive role to protect its own interests in the region. So Rath spoke earlier to Jason Hsu, Senior Research Fellow at a Harvard Kennedy School Ash Center for Democratic Governance and Innovation. Hsu was also a former KMT legislator and frequent speaker and participant at global defense conferences. Jason, the first three-way national security meeting between the United States, the Philippines, and Japan just took place. How significant is this first meeting? It's, it's obviously one of the most pivotal moments in the Indo-Pacific security theater. U.S. is getting more and more involved in the development of the regional security and obviously with the grand strategy to contain China. And U.S. Is, needs more allies with firm commitments in the security and the regional defense. So Japan and Philippines are the two natural partners. Japan being on the entry of the uh, uh, first island chain, uh, well situated in the northeast of the region, uh, it, it is the entry point of the first island chain. And Philippines is sort of the, the back door of the uh, uh, first island chain. So the two partners uh, with a uh, shared uh, security promise and a commitment and with action oriented policy of coordination with the U.S. is probably the most important agenda uh, on the security um, program uh, for Biden administration. Is this a coincidence that Taiwan is smashed in between Japan and the Philippines? Without official military to military government to government relations, uh, Taiwan is in an awkward position to be included in the uh, security program. Uh, but it is important to note that Taiwan is at the center of the um, uh, Indo-Pacific uh, regional security. So, uh, however, uh, we are not in the uh, official program, but Taiwan is, it is in it and it is uh, involved. I believe there are unofficial dialogues and program developments are being done uh, as we speak. Uh, it is just not uh, you know, official capacity. It is true that Taiwan is enmeshed in the whole Indo-Pacific and the first island chain security development, but we are also playing a very integral role in providing intelligence as well as the regional uh, defense coordination as well. Do you see more cooperation between the Philippines and Taiwan directly, given that Japan and the U.S. have always been involved, but there seems to be a new development where the Philippines is having a greater role. The, the reason why Philippines playing a more and more uh, involved role is uh, uh, China's sea power expansion is growing larger and larger in the South China Sea and uh, extending to the Malacca Strait as well as the surrounding waters of Philippines, uh, uh, starting from the Subic Bay and extending to the uh, 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 near Taiwan Strait. Uh, obviously, Taiwan and Philippines share a common thread of the security dilemma and security concern. So it is very important that Philippines um, stands alongside of the U.S.'s broader Indo-Pacific security program. Being the U.S., Jason, do you feel that this is a reaction to Chinese aggressive actions, or do you feel it's also on the U.S. part that it's bringing allies together and making China feel more insecure. On the broader picture, uh, obviously, U.S. and China are um, in this uh, strategic competition um, trend uh, for the, 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 the some time to come. And we, we, we are very clear that uh, U.S. will continue to develop the regional uh, alliances in in, with an aim to contain China's ambition in the region. And it is of a critical importance that China can be deterred from expanding their military power, uh, air power, uh, and sea power dominance. So U.S. is doing it in various ways, not only just from the military perspective, but also from industry, technology, uh, um, export control programs such as uh, semiconductor. So you can see this is so-called the total uh, containment 
from the U.S. to China, from industry to military. It's interesting you mentioned that there's a total containment policy that the U.S. is taking, but there's also been reports that the Biden administration is delaying some of that in exchange for more dialogue. How do you see that? We see from uh, National Security Advisor Jake Sullivan's speech in late April uh, at Brookings Institution, he laid out that U.S.'s plan is to to con conduct so-called compete and cooperate uh, with China. Um, Chinese uh, China and the U.S. will compete in the critical areas um, such as national security or technologies, and U.S. will do its part to maintain as great uh, a leadership as possible. But also there are areas that U.S. would like to seek cooperation and collaboration with the Chinese counterparts, such as um, uh, climate change and other uh, critical uh, issues containing the regional uh, economic development. Uh, we see this sort of dual approaches to the U.S.-China relations. I see the, the two sides will find it difficult to conduct such a dual approach. The two-pong approach will inevitably meet with challenges because U.S. and China uh, currently lack a um, trust base and which will prevent uh, the two sides to engage in any substantive uh, in, um, cooperation or uh, the dialogue that uh, t um, Secretary Blinken is going to have with the Chinese leadership, um, I'm afraid it's going to be um, symbolic and uh, superficial too. U.S. National Security Advisor Jake Sullivan, his Japanese counterpart Takeo Akiba, and Philippine Secretary of the Interior Eduardo Ando met in Tokyo on June 16th. How significant is this meeting, given that it's first Raymond? It's very significant because it's trilateral. It's among it's a high, very high level. It's among the three national security advisors. And uh, also they talk about their alliance. Also they try to figure out what specifically they try to do. Actually, they came out with a joint uh, reading of the statement. Actually, they are focusing on four aspects. The one, the first one is to enhance the security and defense capabilities, like they will jointly do maritime activities and uh, trying to get a deepen cooperation in, ter in terms of the defense based on their use experience, like the uh, Philippines and U.S. Um, cooperation for additional locations for U.S. bases and uh, for Japanese reciprocal and the Filipino re reciprocal visit. And the second area is in the area of maritime free and open order. Like they will, for, for the first time, they will have uh, jointly trilateral Coast Guard exercises, mm -hmm. which is very practical and which is uh, trilateral. Uh, which is uh, on the Coast Guard level, but you want to maintain the free and open maritime order among their relevant waters. And also they are trying to raise the awareness in the maritime domain awareness, meaning have closer and uh, uh, more precise uh, monitoring on the maritime situations. Third area is on humanitarian assistance. The fourth one is especially on economic order, like in they are trying to alert to against, act against economic coercion and trying to foster tr three countries' economic security and resilience. So you can see the ambit of their national security is not only in that defense, not only military, but including economic and uh, joint uh, activities in law enforcement. So how do you think Taiwan can work best with these three nations? Taiwan has a limited cooperation in terms of Coast Guard, for example, training and exchange of information and uh, reciprocal visit with the re relevant states. Mm -hmm. But apart from that, Taiwan has a li very limited uh, scope to cooperate with uh, their allies. Actually, I will argue that the national security machineries and the think tanks people, we need to push forward 
for a closer cooperation or relationships between Taiwan and the other regional states. Mm -hmm. And Professor, you know, we've been all talking about um, pretty much most of the show, the trilateral meeting and how uh, these neighboring countries, the first island chain, can work together to foster um, a better alliance and stronger alliance. But all these states, for instance, for the Philippines, dates back to the mismatch of promises that China had for Philippines during the era of Duterte. And this is why we're seeing the consequences right now. Now China knows what's going on. Well, do you think it's possible for them to also kind of change their strategies a little bit more? Um, basically, I think uh, China will not change what they are doing mm -hmm. because this is an uh, ongoing and long-standing policy uh, in the South China Sea. They may be softened in terms of uh, their attitude and also their tone, but fundamentally, they are not going to change any policy guideline related especially relevant to sovereignty in mm -hmm. the South China Sea. And Alex, for the U.S. defense reports have also projected that there could probably be a shift of balance of power um, in the Western Pacific from U.S. to China by 2025. Do you think this is likely? Well, we are only uh, two plus years away from 2025. Uh, a shifting of a uh, strategic posture or power balance uh, would not be that easy and won't be that fast. Mm -hmm. uh, I think um, even though Taiwan is not uh, participating in this trilateral or not even mentioned, but, but if we look at the U.S.-Japan alliance and uh, in, uh, you know, enhanced U.S.-Filipino uh, relationship, uh, Taiwan is definitely part of their discussion. Uh, mm -hmm. And uh, even more, I would argue that Taiwan would be the main focus of their discussion. Uh, for that reason, I, I think uh, the gradual increase of uh, U.S. Uh, warming up relationship with the Philippines uh, will balance the triangle and, and make the alliance system in the, along the First Island chain more balanced. And, and also uh, the strengthening of the southern part of Taiwan, which means U.S.-Filipino uh, relationship will match with the uh, already very strong U.S.-Japan alliance. And that will, uh, you know, better, you know, hold the, uh, the uh, you know, the United States' interest in the Taiwan Strait, mm -hmm. definitely. Speaking of Taiwan's um, strategic location, as you mentioned, it's sandwiched between the two countries. Mm -hmm. And um, this meeting also talked about joint naval drills between Japan and the Philippines. Mm -hmm. Do you feel this will change the equation and prevent mm -hmm. China from having an upper hand here? Well, I, I don't think it's uh, going to be that easy. Uh, and uh, Japan and the Philippines, uh, they have a different uh, capability, uh, SC. And I, but, but this newly developed concept and continued practice will help them to develop or to exploit, you know, the deficiencies and uh, what needs to be improved. If you like our show, please search for us on YouTube, give us a thumbs up, and hit subscribe to our channel. Thank you for watching our show today. Stay safe and see you next time.